Okay. Okay. okay, it's great to be back. Um, so the talk uh, today um, is, is following on from the workshop that we've had all afternoon, uh, which is um, the workshop on intelligent music production. And I promised uh, a, a stimulating and controversial talk so that we could all go to the pub with something to think about. Uh, so there will be um, definitely politics and religion. I didn't manage to get any sex in there, but there's politics and religion. You know, I mean, that's uh, something good to start with. Um, so I was thinking while preparing the talk and, and talking and chatting today, uh, the first time I saw WIMP, W-Y-M-P, was um, in computer science class in about 1980-something. Um, and it was Windows interfaces with mice and pointers. Uh, those of you that are old enough to remember the days before that, um, it, oddly, it started at Park um, Palo Alto Research Center, what was the Xerox uh, re company's research group, that began this idea of um, pointing devices um, as early as the kind of late 60s, early 70s. Um, playing around with, when you watch these videos of the guys using them now, it's hilarious. You sort of move the thing and then look at the screen and move this and look at the screen. Wow, and then there's this kind of penny drop moment where they're like, oh. And then things connect. And you can see in this, you know, in this one moment, the sort of future of computing starting to uh, appear. But, you know, I, I do like these sort of thought experiments of time travel where you could go back and to change the course of technology history. And, and at the time, the, the other big competing thing was light pens. Does anyone remember that? You, 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 uh, and this is very much the paradigm that we've got to now, where you reach out to the data with your hand and you touch and manipulate objects which are right there in, in front of you. And it's kind of interesting to think that we could have bypassed the whole proxy of the mouse and the pointer and gone straight to light pens, um, only that, that's just not what happened. So my point is with this that if we come full circle, if this is WIMP again, the decisions that we make in research have profound, massive impacts on how whole branches of technology develop. So I felt that what I needed to do for this talk was to just zoom right out so the view from 50,000 feet of the idea of combining artificial intelligence and creative production, but specifically audio. So we're here to talk about music production. Um, and what are, the, what are the big questions with that and what are the implications of it? So I should begin with uh, some books. Rather than sticking the references at the end, because I probably have to wrap up in a hurry when I realize I've overrun <laughs> really badly and we're just going to make a dive for the pub, um, let's do the references right up front. So there's a bit of light reading that I personally find quite inspirational. Um, this is an awesome book. If you can find one, um, I've seen them on Amazon going for 20 or 30 quid, and it's a little paperback, which you can possibly see in the top corner there was uh, retailing for 75 cents. Um, Gislin is the editor, and what he's done is compiled uh, a bunch of essays by um, Albert Einstein, uh, Mozart, Rudyard Kipling, Amy Lowell, Ernst, uh, Catherine Ann Porter. I don't, I'm not really sure who she is. Should do. Uh, Henry Miller, um, Jung. Uh, I mean, it's a huge, huge list. I think there's about 30 essays in there. And when I read this book, it blew my mind. And it's still a, a profound influence on, on me in the thinking today. These are some of the smartest people who ever lived. And this is their take on cr the creative processes, where ideas come from, how they transcend the, the, the thought patterns that they're in and get to somewhere else. So uh, that's a very important book, in my opinion. Um, the other one that I would like to recommend, you may already know, uh, is, is uh, Persig's famous Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, especially if you work in academia, this is a good book to kind of raise questions of quality and process um, and, and, and values. The other source that I'll be drawing on, I really need to give a nod to, is one of my favorite philosoph modern philosophers, he's 
not with us anymore. Uh, he's gone now. It's uh, Rick Roderick. He's uh, a famous, the famously the cowboy philosopher who wrote a lot about technology, well, human values uh, in particular. But I think this has a, an important resonance with what we're going to be looking at today. So, uh, so a nod to Rick Roderick, the uh, philosopher there. So let's begin with golf. Where else? I apologise to any of my students that have heard this anecdote before, but it's, I, think it's, I think it's a good one. Um, you know those annoying radio ads where two people yabber backwards and forth? I did a few of those once, and um, it was a really good learning experience to be in the sausage factory at the radio station where you've just got to put stuff out. It's got to go to air. And scripts come down from upstairs, and they're the usual kind of advertising tripe. Yeah. Hey, Bob, where can I get a great deal on golf supplies? Don't get teed off at your lack of golf needs. Swing by golf, Bob's Golf Emporium at 22 the High Street. And it says in the script, sounds of golf, club swinging, that kind of thing. You know. so, and I go to the library. There's a big old catalog. You have a Sadie system and a big old catalog. And there's all the CDs on the shelf. Hollywood Edge, whatever it was, and it's like hockey, football, no golf. The golf CD's missing, it's not in the catalogue, uh, and I'm stuck for ages on, on, this, um, on this ad. The, a more senior producer comes down, and, uh, and, it, and I learned this very important lesson from him, um, Simon, I think was his name, and um, he walked into the studio and said, Come on, far now. What's going on? Why, why, are these radio, why are these ads not out on there? There's a huge stack of them in your in-tray. You've got to be like, shh, 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 get them out. Um, and as I'm stuck, I'm looking for a golf, golf sound effect. Can't find one. And this is oh, for sake. There's a 58 plugged in on the desk with an XLR. And he picks it up. <laughs> Job done. And it's just a slight pitch shift on on that, and I heard it go out to air, and there's in a taxi, I heard it go out to air that night. And when you put it in context, when you, know, you set it up with the narrative, this is the art of sound design, it doesn't need that realism. It just works. You hear that, and it just, you, your brain says, that's somebody playing golf. Um, so the question this raised for me, this is why I said, what is, in, what is intelligence in music production? Because it struck me that, that in that moment, Simon was exercising the, the epitome of intelligence. Not just to get the job done, but to really think about what the job is and, uh, and how to go. So, uh, well, billions and billions and billions of neurons. I, I guess the other take on it is this sort of Steve Jobs thing. It, th there's a gadget. There's, a, there's an app for that. So we can say, there's an app for that. There's a thing here that does that, an I thing, a smart thing, that's going to solve it. What really sobered me up in AI when I studied, um, before it was called machine learning, we um, used to talk about artificial intelligence more, I was reading uh, Dennett, uh, Minsky, people like that, um, Penfield, Emperor's New Mind, very good, uh, Churchland, uh, all those kind of guys. And what you realize is there's a kind of mundanity, actually, to artificial intelligence. Uh, there, there's a real sort of work a day. It can do stuff. It can model human intelligence. But people get very kind of overexcited about it, maybe, and imagine things which artificial intelligence, certainly in its present state, and maybe for many decades or even a century away, are, are not really going to happen. Um, and there's lots of philosophical thought experiments, Turing test and things like this that kind of do muddy the waters a little bit, I think. So what I'm going to do is to try and go through a tour of what, in all of the parts of our project, intelligent music production, what is production, what is music, and what is intelligence? And how do those things combine together into a plausible uh, idea of, of music intelligence? Uh, and, and I hope to kind of, you know, this is my personal view here at the bottom, is that I really hope that in the end it amplifies human experience and doesn't replace it. Um, if I had to describe my own personal disposition um, philosophically, politically, I'd say I'm a humanist. I really 
Um, I was once a member of a, the only ism that I've ever wanted to put my name to, other than maybe than scientist, as a humanist. And uh, I did um, work for a humanist organization uh, once upon a time. So. so what is production? Let's look at this first. Um, it's defining production. Goods and services was the first thing that I found in the dictionary. That really, in order to make product, to define production, you had to define it within a market context, that stuff had to be made to be sold. Um, if you research production and look at it, you tend to stumble on Marxist philosophies involving surplus value, the action of labor, energy, and so on, on raw materials and the role of machines in innovation. Innovation is a key concept that allows capitalism to continue to expand as a, as a process and an ideology. Um, but there's a sense in which it doesn't create anything. It merely reworks. It's uh, very self-contained. So um, there's also the idea that we can produce goods, but we can produce bads as well. No? There's lots of things that we can produce which aren't desirable. Piles of rubble, dead bodies, pollution, whatever. Um, and I think there's always a cautionary tale in, in every kind of analysis of technology about you know, what, what are the good things, what are the human values to pursue in developing the technology. And I've uh, spoken with Christian about this many times, uh, about the, the lack of reflective ethics in uh, university level research. It's just not on the radar at all. Um, so there's this thing in economics called the third person test. Would you pay somebody else to do it? Uh, paint, painting your house? Yeah. Uh, going to the beach for you? Kind, kind of doesn't make sense to pay someone to go and see a concert for you or do something like that. So if we were to go back a hundred years and ask somebody that you pay them to make music for you, they kind of look at you a bit funny. I mean, music is essentially something else, even within that frame of a century ago, that wouldn't necessarily have passed the third person test in a slightly earlier era. Uh, so let me bear that in mind as we go through. Um, I thought I'd make a thought experiment um, to, to, to try and take this apart and unpack it a bit more. So imagine we have a random number generator. Uh, it produces stuff, it produces random numbers. Um, but what's the value of those random numbers? And what context creates that value? Um, and so we might want to distinguish between these degrees of in, uh, information can become data, can become knowledge, can become useful knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Let's then take that random number generator and use those as cryptocurrency. So we now have a scarcity attached to finding specific random numbers within that set that meet some conditions. We need to apply work, literally energy, to power the microprocessors to do it so we can mine bitcoins, and thereby we seem to attach a value to them. But Really, we're missing something here. There's something else, because you could set up an infinite number of cryptocurrencies, and in, and in fact, that's happening. They're proliferating. Um, what gives value to a, a particular cryptocurrency? There's something more human to the data than its scarcity alone. So let's now attach that random number generator to uh, a handle that can only be worked by uh, people in the uh, uh, factory, and I think we come to a, I think we come to an interesting conclusion. Here's a business model, you know? Here's a sense in which the thing that is produced accrues its value by the human element that's attached to it. I mean, clearly I'm making a joke here. This is, this is a bad thing, right? Um, you've heard this expression, suffering for art. Well, there's something about good music, is there not, that tells a story about somebody's life that involves, now maybe not sleepless nights in a rat-infested garret penning protest songs or whatever, but there's, a, there's a, a, a value in the human life that's gone towards the creativity. Um, and I think 
the, the thing that brought that home for me was the night that Amy Winehouse died. Um, I, I was shocked at the cynicism of the music business, which, sold, which had advertising for Smirnoff Ice, Gordon's Gin, all of the alcohol manufacturers were queuing up to insert their adverts into the retrospective, which had been carefully prepared in anticipation of uh, uh, Amy shrugging off mortal coil. And uh, I, I kind of thought, you know, this is really somehow the essence of what, what made that music, other than her uh, incredible talent, was uh, this relationship uh, the, the, and the humanity. So um, this is the question, you know, can we, um, can we have value without this human element? Okay, um, I want to talk about Donatella Meadows for a minute. Uh, she is, a, I guess you would call her a human cybernetics person. I'm not sure if she's still around. Um, amazingly underestimated woman. Uh, she wrote The Limits of Growth uh, and also a book called Where to Intervene in the System. And when I talk to uh, uh, organisational psychologists or quality managers about this kind of thing, they say, Meadows really gets it. She knows that the place that you change stuff is, ne is not tinkering around with cash flows, but is to deal with the, very, the values which are the foundation of the system. And so if you have a broken philosophy, uh, such as, and the, what the philosophy that I'm going to raise here is the idea of music as a product and to put that into question. Uh, because I think whether or not you agree that music can be and is a product, by, by raising this question will help you understand how to approach it through the lens of creativity and whether or not machines can be applied to that. So um, here's one of my little bugbears. Uh, which is consumption. And the way that we talk about music consumption, as if music could be destroyed by the act of listening to it. Because that's what consumption is. Consumption is a process that, reduces, that increases entropy. And it reduces the value of the thing because the uh, food here on the left is worth more than what comes out your backside on the right. Uh, but that's a very human perspective, because if we were a plant, we would have a slightly different view on that. So what other words can you use instead of consumption? Well, listener, you know, viewer, audience. We've gone through a period of great deflation, deflation of, of the value of language in a very Orwellian way. To reduce everything to a consumer, uh, as if that was, you know, I find that very derogatory and demeaning uh, comment on the human condition, that you're a consumer. Uh, that's a very particular viewpoint imposed upon the process of creating and, and listening to music. In fact, what I would argue is that not only do you not reduce the value of um, an artistic media by listening to it or viewing it, you increase its value. The act of going to see a movie increases its value because it's entered the cultural milieu. It's become more valuable by your act of participating in it. So when you listen to music, you're not consuming it, certainly. You're perhaps even partaking in some kind of co-production. OK. This is me channeling Rick Roderick, but I, I, I just love his thing. So you, you've got to see the original. Does anybody remember the great hula hoop riots of 1967? when people went out onto the streets and they demanded, hula hoops or death? Hula hoops or death? Because it never happened. Um, that never happened. People, someone was messing around with a plastic chair. We're like, oh, OK. Perhaps we could sell some of these, make a few records, put them out. Manufactured needs. Uh, kind of be the era that we live in. Uh, and there's a mythology here that capitalism meets the need, production meets the needs of consumption. 
and this is wrong on so many levels. It really doesn't, except some very basic human needs, you know, food production and so on. Most of the time what happens is people are experimenting around and they find the possibility, and then the need is created to market that new product. And what this leads to, and I've seen this in many technology companies, is what I call you know, problem-oriented thinking. Is when you want to write the business model, you have to say something like, we identified this problem, and this is our solution. And our solution solves this problem, uh, and so give us money and we'll develop this. And if you think, what's that doing to your thinking? It's narrowing it into a problem-oriented perspective. It reduces everything to a problem. You only see things remedially. It's like, oh, here's a problem. People can't use mixing decks. They're idiots. What we need to do is produce a, a solution to that problem. I think that arts are not about solving problems. That's, that's bled in from scientific thinking. Arts are about opportunity and possibility. And so enabling possibility rather than solving problems is just a better place to start from philosophically than what problem does this solve? Yeah. Because maybe it's a problem to you, but it's not a problem to somebody else. Um, who here has not heard of the Japanese term chindogu? OK, most of you. Uh, chindogu is amazing. It, only the Japanese could have a name for this. I love it. It's those useless things um, which are not entirely useless. There has to be some plausibility. Chindogu cannot be absurd. So inflatable dartboards, waterproof sponges, ashtrays for motorbikes, they don't count. They're not chindogu, right? They're ridiculous. You wouldn't want them. But there has to be something that somebody, if they walked into a shop and they saw it, and they're just like, oh, a motorized, battery-operated spinning spaghetti ball. This is what my life's been missing. And you know it's destined for a landfill, but uh, it has its moment. Yeah, I'm chindogu, I, I love it. Um, so uh, hula hoops, dancing robot cats. I have no idea how that got in there. Okay, I'm going to need to enlarge this slightly. You might have seen this one um, before, um, and I'm not quite sure. Let me try. Please work. Can you see that? Can you see any of that at all? OK, I'll, I'll try and read it from, from here. Um, we have um, Make Me Sound Like. And we've got uh, the Beatles. Um, we've got uh, let's see, a whole bunch of stuff on here. I really wish. Oh, I know, I know. Just get this out of full screen for a moment. And um, just go on here. Please work, please work, please work. Um, there we are. Let's go to big. Okay, there we go. The Dream On Pro. Yeah. Uh, maybe once more. OK. I told you this would be my last lecture. <laughs> Kill hours and hours of your free time believing that a single piece of good-looking software can make you sound like a can see what's going on here. Um, we've got the unfunky drummer with uh, uh, rock and roll. Mick Fleetwood control there. IQ, you can turn up the IQ. Probably best to turn that down on the drummer. Um, <laughs> presence, uh, here, not here, on their way. Um, we've got the make me sound like um, Beatles. There's even a separate control for more Beatles. Um, that's, that's quite nice. <laughs> Uh, and then there's a control here to change the decade, and a nice display here to say um, what you've got in terms of, uh, you know, of course, uh, environmental pronouncements, uh, political left and more left. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have the creative difference engine. Um, this is when things all kind of break up and go wrong. We can. Uh, uh, Click in a session. We're on session musician at the moment, but if it's necessary, you can kind of go to solo project. Um, and then drug dealer for the ego controls, distance and frequency, and so on. That's useful. Uh, I like that. Arguments. It's got a punch control. Um, 
Yeah, we got the excellentalizer. Excellence, shit, really good, okay. Um, you, if, if 80s isn't shiny enough, there's German. We can add German, I like that. And then we can camp it up a little bit here. Let out your inner princess with the Blonsky beat. Uh, we've got energy, high and higher, uh, and so on. So, you know, I'll just leave that. I, I, I can tell that you guys find this funny, and I think you know why. Um, where have we been going with kind of plugins for, for, for quite a while? Um, what's going wrong with that, and how can we fix it? So let's, uh, let's move on. Let's go back and take the word production and unpack that back into the task of production, which is the music producer. What does a music producer do? Um, here's George. He epitomizes for me the old school music producer in that this is his role, uh, to understand the artist as well as the tech. Um, to work with other engineers, manager, etc., be part of a team. It's a, a human-centered role to mediate and facilitate, to hide the technical details, um, manage time and resources, and understand the production process in full, but not necessarily implement it all. I'll analyze this a little bit more in future. I want to kind of rock through a few of these. Um, let's hypothesize a type two producer emerging uh, 80s, mid 80s, early 80s, maybe, uh, maybe even late 70s. I actually picked uh, Trevor Horn for this because I think he's one of the earliest people that uh, typifies this role. Uh, it, he takes on more of the of the of the complete project. Uh, so a singular production unit, conceiving, composing, arranging, recording, mixing, editing, and mastering, and even packaging uh, the pieces. So. Um, a very well-rounded knowledge, actually still using kind of traditional technology at this stage. Um, and then we go through the digital revolution, the democratization of music technology, and we see this type three emerging, the EMP, electronic music producer. Um, there's an interesting cloud around the identity of the artist, and we start to see people who are deliberately ambiguous in their identity, think of like gorillas or something like that, where you know, they have a, a cartoon avatar to represent the band. No one's really sure who the band are. Are they like a, a, a famous artist working undercover doing something else? Um, or are they a, a, a DJ? Are they selecting other people's material and putting it together? Um, but this person is really interesting because they're starting to be creative in ways that we don't see with the other guys. Um, they're designing the audio process. They're looking for interesting sources, make, creating new effects and treatments, um, making choices about plug-in chains, uh, and, and programming synthesizers. This idea that emerged in the 80s of you not using the presets, but you're going to program your synthesizer to create new sounds. And people wanted new sounds. That was kind of what that uh, movement was all about. Uh, Designing also the control processes, uh, which would lead to good, interesting composition. So we have you know, the use of random, uh, aleatoric work. Um, using new and interesting controllers, this is a tradition that we call NIME now, new interfaces for musical expression. How can you hook up a strain gauge to a ruler or a um, you know, thermistor to something that you can blow on and create new uh, input uh, signals? Um, creating musical tools, sequences, and so on, Max, PD. Um, so here's the general process, reworking the elements and, and, and taking an individual quality control process, taking it to a club, seeing how it goes down, changing the baseline maybe and, and re-releasing it uh, and so on. So it's a much tighter control loop. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then I've identified a kind of new thing, and this is what I've discovered, I've, I've been working in this for about eight or nine years now, which I, I guess we call like the prosumer. I hate that word, it's the only thing I could find. Uh, which is people who are not musicians and they don't really want to be musicians. They don't have that same ego attachment to their produce that they want to put out and have people circulate and publish. They just want to enjoy playing with that device. So they want to be able to have the, the fun of remixing a tune, um, but without actually, you know, the seriousness of saying, I, you know, I work as a music producer. Um, they're going to be playing with this on the train. It's very casual, mostly mobile oriented. 
Um, so there's a few uh, companies and software things. The actual photo there is from Brian Eno's Bloom. Has anyone played with that? That's really enchanting and fun thing to play with. But it would be very hard to record the output of that and say, this is my music. But why not? Another question to put there. Okay, so um, the type one producer is essentially a top down. So thinking back to, to George Martin, you know, he's mediating between the artist, um, selecting what can and can't be implemented, but he defers to the artist. Um, he or she must respect and protect and nurture the vision of the artist. Um, it, this, this matches quite well with what we call a waterfall model in software engineering. You're bookended by very strong constraints on what comes in, which is someone else's vision, and what comes out and where you leave off the, pro the product. Um, and you must understand the tools very deeply and be able to work fast. You're, in, you're facilitating someone else's. Um, I'm going to miss out the middle and go straight to the end. Um, the type three is, is kind of the opposite. It's bottom up. So the EMP... Uh, in, that the producer, um, she's going to sit there playing around in the studio and have happy accidents, there's going to be some serendipity, discovery through experimentation, building up a library of tools and techniques. And this is the personal currency of that kind of producer. This is um, what gives them their style, is the tricks and idiosyncrasies of what they've learned that they can do with the tools. And when I hung out, and when I was working in Bristol, would be on the drum and bass scene, and that was what the, you know, the, the drum and bass scene was all about, was producers would have their trick, you know, and then maybe, you know, they, they tell you, ah, oh, you know, this is, this is how I chop those beats up or something. But mostly it'd be a, something they kept to themselves. So you've got a bit of a, um, trade secrets in there, if you like. But, Generally, what made the culture is that they did get circulated, you know, by people hanging out in the studio, so you'd pick up how someone was doing something. Um, but what's interesting about type three is they're actually very happy to defer to the tools. Now, in contrast to the experimental music person in academia, kind of electroacoustic, that kind of high-end, highbrow experimental music, using C sound, using Super Collider, whatever, the type three EMP is quite happy to just say, hey, that sounds cool, doesn't it? I'm gonna use that. I have a very practical attitude. And I don't necessarily need to understand how that worked. I'm quite happy to just take it and go with it. Uh, so this attitude is something that we, we need to consider in how people use uh, tools for, for production. Okay. Now here's a symbol that you haven't seen for a long time. I mean, these guys are gone now, but this was the biggest power block on the planet for a long time, and they felt it fit to put this on their flag because tools are really, really important. Tools are what it was all about for, um, in a Marxist philosophy. The means of production, the ability to create is governed by your access to and ability to use tools. If you don't have the tools, you can't do the work. Well, let's look at some trends happening here. Um, tools shape products massively. Think about the average car and how that's changed over the years. In the 90s, you could only see these very sleek cars, very curvy. And that's because most of the designers were using the same CAD software that had these bezier spline curves in them. So everything they created was massively influenced by the tools. And the same in music production. You hear the sounds of various decades and uh, clusters of artists going by, and they're very rooted in the tools that they use. You know, here's the auto-tune era. You know, here's the phase synchronous overlap and add time stretch era, and you can just hear it in everything that comes out. Um, but eventually, there is a tendency for tools to replace technique and knowledge. And what saddened me a, a, a lot, I remember reading on a sound design forum, uh, someone asking a question, how do I make such and such a sound? How do I make this explosion sound? They said, oh, you need the Ultra Bang plugin. No? Uh, Ultra Boom 3, I use that for all my explosions. And, and I really kind of thought, there's something being lost here. Um, you know, we take it to some sort of compression or something. Now, here's a vocal plugin, it's those perfect vocals. But where is the knowledge then about? Um, you know, 
thresholds and, and knee curves and so on. You know, some, somehow it's, it's lost. And I think that you know, there is this tension, and I could feel it today, about what's the utility of tools that hide knowledge completely? And you, you just get over it. You don't need to know that anymore. The same way that you drive a car these days, you have no idea what's going on under the bonnet. Is, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that knowledge of those tools is absolutely profoundly valuable knowledge you know, that we should sort of preserve and uh, uh, replicate to other generations. Um, eventually, the knowledge and access to the tools becomes the product. So I see a lot of people in music technology who are not interested in producing music, they're interested in producing products to facilitate the music. And I think to a large degree, a lot of the work that I've done is kind of in that, in that spirit. You know, I'm uh, interested in producing enabling tools, but maybe I, I'm not really got my eye on the ball of how I would use them myself. Um, but I think this is a very important topic because modern tools are things like the internet, general purpose computing, and to a certain extent, I think they're under threat. They're under threat of sort of disappearing and becoming replaced by... Um, certainly with the cloud, in which the tools you use are somewhere else. Now, what we say in the um, computer science community, you know, um, the cloud is just your stuff on somebody else's computer, uh, which is kind of quite a sobering thought. Do you, you know, do you have that control over that anymore? OK, so let's move on. Whole new topic, intelligence. We've considered what is production, let's consider what is intelligence. And I'm, there's a lot here, so I'll try and get through it quickly. So let's break it down into lower intelligence, human intelligence, and then you know, everything else. Um, we have basic input and output. Touching, smelling, hearing, and all of the faculties, cognitive uh, apparatus attached to that. Uh, to separate signal from noise, resolve ground from form, and so on. Uh, then on the top of the sensory level, we construct a conceptual level, which is we want to be able to reason about the world, at least at this pre-verbal stage, in terms of dimensions, uh, in terms of things that are physically there. So uh, space, time, and mass, they're the fundamental units uh, that we build all physics on. Uh, and within that, we differentiate degrees of, of these qualities. So, you know, louder or quieter, hot and cold, light and dark, and so on. Having experienced this, we now build a layer of what we call empiricism. Is have, the, have our neural apparatus, having been exposed to experiences of, of the perceptual and the conceptual, able to remember and to compare and... Uh, think about things that have been previously experienced in order to build higher levels of uh, intelligence on. Uh, so this is about representation in many ways, uh, the symbols we use, uh, language and so on. Uh, and ultimately it's very important for any system that it can forget. All biological systems in order to, to learn have to be able to forget. Uh, you know, if you couldn't forget then grief would disable the rest of your life. Uh, and think about this maybe in the context of Google and the, the data pollution problem. Systems that never forget are fundamentally flawed in that sense that I said about Donatella Meadows, uh, that, there's, that the philosophy is really broken. They will break because the inability to forget is, is problematic. So it, it disables the ability to create these higher levels of intelligence. Um, OK, so given memory and uh, these constructs that we've stored in our neural apparatus, uh, can we match? Can we just say that I've seen something like this before? This looks like a, a such and such. Uh, but classification, recognition, they're all subtly different things, but they're of the uh, same kind of thing. Um, to distinguish and differentiate between remembered things and things that we're presented with. And what I want you to do as we go through all of these stages of... Um, of intelligence is to think, what is the musical or audio uh, equivalent of that? Now, do we recognize a sound? Is that a kind of sound, a type of sound? Can it be classified? Have I heard this melody before? Is it like this? You know, And how would we 
What does it mean to create tools which can do these things? So is it possible, for instance, to have something that can listen to a bunch of melodies and say, you know, all of this George Clinton Parliament P-Funk stuff kind of sounds a little bit like uh, this Prince stuff or something. So maybe, you know, there's a connection between these. Maybe they're influenced by each other. Uh, it's the same bass player, isn't it? It's just Bootsy Collins. Something like that, you know. Um, OK. Then we have ranking. Uh, which is organizing things into ordinal or cardinal scales. So, you know, is, is this bigger than that? It, it, the, where does this lie in this sequence? Um, we think we've got it nailed for, mu for music and timbre. It seems that, like, the spectrum, the literal frequency spectrum, has a, a, a direct affinity with, what, with timbre. But it turns out um, it's much, much more complex. There's a really nonlinear, interesting... A manifold there that maps absolute spectrums to uh, timbre and how we perceive them. Um, melodies. We think that we've got this ordinal and cardinal thing sorted for notes, but F A C E and then is the C in the E? Is the E above the C or not? Because if it's a cyclic scale, then what makes it's actually the, the C's lower because they're closer together in the wrapped space. So there are very interesting questions to ask about audio as a perceptual faculty and how we rank things and how we order stuff. Uh, this leads to structure. If we can rank things, we can build them into more complex uh, arrangements. So their relationship, perhaps hierarchy, um, and uh, bringing in the temporal dimension, causality is a structural relationship on time. So um, you can say that this, that this chord change here has to happen because, you know, the progression up until that point suggests this cadence. And so therefore there's a natural you know, compositional uh, causality, if you like. You know, this mid like causes this uh, to be a possibility maybe. <clears throat> okay. Wow, we're getting deep into the philosophy, so let's speed it up a little bit. Um, once we've got these layers, we have these, these concepts, which we kind of guess we'd lump together as epistemology. The idea of possibility, uh, categorical reasoning, this belongs to, to this set, uh, contingency, if this happens and that happens, maybe this other thing would, um, looking like programming, looking very much like the logic of um, uh, computer programming in the high-level languages we use now. Um, and qualifiers, you know, it's always true that for this, and you know, it's this uh, concept exists, and so on. And then I suppose the layer that we would put on top of that, uh, it, I've used the term here, classical reason. This is what we generally think of um, as somebody who, uh, like a detective, like Sherlock Holmes, can can think in terms of causation and structure, and infer things, in, in, interpolate, extrapolate, uh, regress from a set, and figure out what the cause of that was, and so on. Um, does this apply uh, in, in music systems? Yes, definitely. All of these human reasoning faculties, intelligence faculties, have counterparts and possible uses uh, in arts and entertainments and signal processing. So we were talking earlier about the idea of, diagno of diagnosis. This is something that's very, um, the whole branch of expert systems in, in AI during the late 80s and early 90s was about like, medical diagnosis. If you see this symptom and that symptom, and this, then you know, we're looking for this cause. Uh, mechanical diagnosis too. It's like, you know, I can hear a rattling in the, um, in, in the piston rings and there's this funny smell from the exhaust, you know, maybe this is the problem. Um, and uh, who was it? I think it was uh, Henry who was saying, you know, something's going wrong with clipping. How can I diagnose that? I've got a really complex process going on here. I've got loads of sends and returns. I've got tons of channels. I've got dynamic mixing things happening. Um, I need to know right now what the problem is. So, you know, this regressive logic and so on, is it important? Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, to planning and purpose. Very, I mean, we're still talking about lower intelligence here. And this is the stuff that mo basically all animals can do to some degree. Um, sequencing, uh, creating arguments of some kind, reasoning, 
complex constraint solving, navigation, these sorts of things. So um, that's lower intelligence. And what I'd like to do is to separate that now from a whole other branch of intelligence. We're going to call this human intelligence. And I think very importantly, it begins with the self. We are probably not the only organisms which have self-consciousness, but we do. Uh, and um, the idea of the self symbol, uh, Hofstadt is really good on this. You want a light introduction to um, this kind of slightly more concrete existential philosophy about the nature of consciousness and so on. Hofstadt is pretty good. Um, Melanie Klein famously hypothesized this mirror stage in which, you know, the very first time that you understand you're separate uh, from the world in a profound way is seeing yourself in the mirror. Um, so the ability to reason about yourself in relation to a work of art is kind of, is, re is really interesting because it leads to what we call communicative intent and the idea of expression, um, which are say more about in a moment. Okay, um, subjective quality and experience. You know, if you're producing a soundtrack and it turns out that um, jazz music feels nostalgic for you, it may be that jazz music doesn't feel nostalgic to somebody else. Or that the sound of fireworks here in the background conjures up images of a romantic evening in the starlight. It may be that you just come back from a war zone and the sound of fireworks has you diving under the table to make a, a very you know, stark example. Um, so this kind of subjective experience, which we, you know, leads to an understanding through culture of the kind of what most people in that context would experience, it is a kind of important knowledge, but also that knowledge about what it is for yourself and, and for the and maybe a target audience that you're working for. It's very hard kind of knowledge to encode and manipulate uh, and understand. Um, what about emotional intelligence? What's, um, what's that what's a little girl? Yeah, what's the little girl on the right feeling? I think she's a bit jealous, isn't she? Yeah, she's getting the kiss there. I mean, you get that. I mean, it's kind of like raving psychopath, and you just, you know, well, that's just three people in a picture, isn't it? Um, there's something there that, that speaks to you about um, emotional intelligence. And I'm using it here to, to talk about your intelligence about yourself. Uh, generally, if you, you're not aware of why you, what you're feeling and why you're feeling it, it's going to be very hard to express that and to communicate it, especially through music, where you have communicative intent and you're feeling sad and you want to make a sad song and you know, write kind of a dubstep drop, drum and bass, I don't know, it's, um, it's not working. Okay, um, let's speed through these a little bit. Social intelligence. Uh, I think this doesn't need too much explanation. Um, remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs and up the top there is the need for kind of integration and recognition and self yeah, self-actualization, uh, self actualization, thank you. Um, you know, most people that make art are engaged in a process which is doing something like that. They're putting, them, they're putting themselves out there. They're taking a risk. They are expressing something with a communicative intent to get feedback. Um, bear this in mind when you're thinking about the degree in which you're going to use a machine as a crutch to do that. Where is the attribution? Like, where's your soul in that equation, right, in that relationship? Um, we, we shall move on. I, uh, there's a lot to this. Okay, I said there'd be some religion in this. Why not? Um, spiritual intelligence. I, Nick just gave me an amazing video by the guys at um, Imperial College uh, on psilocybin, on psychedelics, and the uh, mystical experience. And, and, and it, it's just awesome. But whether or not, depending on the degree to which you, you kind of acknowledge this, it's part of your life, and it's certainly part of anybody's artistic life, to incorporate and deal with these concepts, you know? Uh, mortality, purpose, your, your, your ancestral 
origins, your legacy to the future, um, and whatever you choose to call it, you know, it's there in the picture in an artistic engagement. Um, and of course, the argument that was this, I, mean, I, I said to my partner, I'm doing a talk on um, machine intelligence and machine creativity. And she immediately said, well, they can't do that. You know, got no soul. And um, yeah, I just stuck. I don't know how to answer that. How, even having read Daniel Dennett and Douglas Hofstadter and the, all of all of that, I just can't answer that. You know, but if this is real and it exists as a human concept, then we must incorporate it into any model of software development. Yeah? It's, there's a problem. There's a hard problem. Here's a kind of uh, intelligence that I think is amazingly human, which is the ability, having really stuffed up on some things, to introspect and say, where did I go wrong? How can I not do that? So what you have is a system which can change itself. It's self-modifying code. Not only does it have a self-symbol, but it has an understanding of the of, of a life experience and the trajectory of the soul of that itself, and what it can do to not just preserve itself on a biological level, but to you know better itself in some way. And art, and this is pure Kierkegaard, you know, that 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 we strive constantly towards this perfection, always reaching to the heavens to produce better and better art. And I wonder how we, if we're going to make machine intelligences that can replicate that, how can they do that if they don't know their limitations, if they can't introspect and they can't understand why they would want to improve themselves, to express themselves in some kind of artistic way. Um, so we're able to do like planned and directed learning. This is not the same as you know, like back propagation in a neural network. It's something, it's a, a much higher level. Okay, uh, and finally, you know, I think this is, this is the layer on the cake. Once you've got all of that that we've just been through, so all of those stacks of intelligence, right at the very top is this ability. And it's the ability to transcend the moment and to transcend the thought structures that you have to come up with something which surprises yourself and surprises everybody around you and and this is a kind of essence of creativity, and it's often part of a struggle, a struggle to resolve competing views of reality, which need to be integrated somehow. Okay. So um, what can we say about higher intelligence? If we can, now if we have human intelligence, we should be able to hypothesize something more. I'm not going to say much about it, really. That's one slide. We're probably unable to really comprehend it or think about what it is by its very nature. By definition, we can't really guess what a higher intelligence would think. Um, but there were some clues. I think Kurt Vonnegut's very good, um, and so is some Asimov, if you want to look into attempts to describe um, how higher intelligences might see the universe you know, outside of time and so on. Right, last section. Um, before we try to integrate these parts. What is music? Um, I've not put a lot in here because you guys know you're involved in music. Um, it has structure. Um, one of the people who mo best abstracts this and deliberately makes it his definition reductionist and insufficient is Varese uh, in describing music as organized sound because it must be, you know, you know if anything, it's, it's organized sound. Um, and, and by factoring out emotion, aims, goals, the narrative and the context and so on, we're kind of saying what music is not, but that's useful, yeah? Or, you know, well, we're not, sorry, we're not saying that, that music incorporates that. So by missing it, we're um, kind of drawing attention to it in a way. Um, one thing that's definitely there in music is beauty. And I think what we, a lot of what we see as beauty is imminent in the universe. You know, it's in our... Of course it's learned, but we see it and we immediately recognize it as, as complex structure, petals in a flower, um, the, you know, and so on. So a lot of the search for uh, content, seeds and stimulus for music is in these kinds of number sequences, uh, fractals, and so on. 
processes that mirror life and nature. Uh, another thing that people like to do to create music is to, that the music is illustrative of something. Now, it might be lyrical, it might be literal, but more recently, there's a, I've seen a big trend towards sonification of data sets. And people say taking the what have you got, migratory flows of fish and turning those into a symphony or something. Um, sometimes you can hear that data in the piece, sometimes you can't, but I think it's a, a valid um, source or attempt to manifest or explain your world through sound. So uh, sometimes I call it dataism. I'm not sure that's. Okay, the function of music. I think this is more interesting. Communicative function of music always involves others. Listeners, audience, uh, to communicate a narrative or feeling, it has a meaning, it has semantics in there. Whether that gets through or not is a different matter. And it can often be about um, you know, relationships or on a wider scale, maybe culture, politics, or educational. But let's contrast that with something which is very different, I think. Communication necessarily involves some kind of expression, but you can, it, you can have expression alone. There's something about just playing an instrument, which is nice, which is fun. And I'm look, looking at Jimmy there, you know, his eyes are shut, and I think he's in a wibbly wobbly world of his own. He, maybe, does he really care that there's like, you know, 5,000 people standing out there in front? He's doing something, there's something going on there which is uh, standing alone in the moment, He's, you know, in terms of expression. And it's kind of led me to the idea of the Schrod Schrodinger's guitar uh, thought experiment. If you play an amazing guitar solo in your bedroom on your own and there's no one else there to hear it, is it still art? No? Is it still a good guitar solo? I think the answer is yes, but absolutely by definition because the, 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 it's, it's about expression, and the expression, that, that's all it needs. You, you, you've, you've experienced that, and it wasn't for anybody else. It wasn't meant to be heard. It wasn't meant to be published. It wasn't meant to be put out there in any way. It was for you and you alone. And we, I think we neglect this in, in, a, in a communicative world with the internet and the idea that we're all quite vain and sort of pro publishing and projecting ourselves and... Every, the music's democratized so everybody can make music and we immediately assume it's music to be heard by somebody else and there's a whole lot of music that's not it's meant to be experienced in the moment and then forgotten forever and the value in it is the expressive value only that's it okay forms of music um, there's not much to say about this uh, we know all about this really it has concrete and abstract forms it can exist as a uh, potential music as a waveform in the air, ready to be recorded. It can be um, in permanently encoded into a record or tape and so on. Or um, more in the kind of vein of things that I'm interested in, it can be expressed in an abstract form that means that it has a deferred form to be realized in full later according to some uh, other parameters. Um, and it can be very abstract indeed. I've been working with a PhD student, um, Julian Brooks, lately, who's in really been into this sort of Cajun thing of uh, text scores, which are very open-ended invitations to um, a, a kind of uh, audience, uh, musicians and an audience to sort of partake in this experience. Uh, and they're just like, written as sort of little koans or um, uh, little kind of pieces of poetry or whatever, you know. Okay, uh, finally, the, for music, is, uh, let's look at the, the process. And this gets a little bit more technical because I'd like to kind of try and make explicit some of the, the, the creative processes that people go through, at least on a sort of mechanical level. So uh, this is what I think of as the hunter-gatherer model, pre-agrarian, kind of wandering around, picking nice-looking cherries and berries off of the trees. Um, it relies on the fact that there's a zero cost to this, that there's a huge abundance uh, perhaps because they're randomly generated or, or something, of, um, what should we call them, creative morsels. Uh, and our only function really is to filter them, to pick out the good ones, the ones that are ripe and juicy, and those will be our product. 
Uh, and I've put here 20th century music business. I think, you know, when you look at the 20th century music business, especially the late 20th century, it relies on this massive overabundance of wannabe talent, of people who are trying to create things. And all it has to do is sit there as a gatekeeper and cherry pick the, the good ones and sort of put them out. Um, in a way, that's a kind of DJ's function. I mean, it's not denigrating it in any way. It's, it's difficult because you're investing your reputation on your choice, on your quality your choice of quality. So an A&R guy or a DJ there is selecting from an abundant pool of stuff that's constantly there. Um, so many creative, you know, machine creative models are of this generate and filter, very simply. Generate a lot of stuff, put some constraints on what gets through, and, and, and there we go. Maybe once it becomes more difficult to generate things, um, or they're more transient, we might want to bring them closer to us. And I think that the, a good analogy here is moving from a hunter-gatherer to a farmer. You, know, you put up a fence around some land, and uh, you have a kind of sense of ownership over it. But here's your pool of ideas. You've got this pool of ideas. And crucially, you look at how the product is performing, and maybe these are market constraints or something, and then you generate templates to pick targets from this pool. So your cycle's very limited. It's still, you're not doing anything here. You're not doing any work at all. You're just getting a big load of ideas, and they're coming in here somehow, and you're selecting them based on the response to your, to your output. So you could think of this as your first IIR filter. Yeah, we've moved from a fur filter to a, a feedback loop. Um, taking this to the next level, and I've kind of left out a bit of the feedback here, but what I want to see here is this, is this reworking of elements in the pool. And I think this is how a lot of creative people work. Writers, um, musicians, they have a bunch of ideas. Maybe they're fragments, maybe they're pieces, and they sit in this pool. And I've heard people say, you know, I, it took me 10 years to write that song. But prominent people say, honestly, you know, I, Sometimes you write it in a night. Sometimes I've been working on that song for 10 years. You know, I've gone back to it over and over again. I never found that mid-late that quite made it work. And then all of a sudden, boom, you know. Um, so, but where are these coming from still? You know, there's a question. There's something generating things. We filtered them. We put them into a pool, and now we're reworking them over and over again. So... Uh, there's not much to say here because this is the notion of feedback. And here's a slightly more advanced model of how that feedback might work because it works at very various levels. Um, it works to develop elements in the pool, but also uh, going back to that human intelligence of a self-adapting system, we learn from our mistakes and we change our processes. Yeah. This is very much a part of a business thinking as well, is, uh, you know, and Donatella Meadows stuff in terms of cybernetics. How do we reflect and change the processes that we do? Some people are one-trick ponies, you know, and they make a whole career out of it. They get something right once, and they do that again and again and again, and, and jolly good luck to them. They're, they're great. They become the, the go-to person for that technique. Other people are never happy to stay there. They're always trying to refine their process. Um, they're always trying to change what it is they're doing. So the feedback here goes back in many levels. And crucially, right back to here, which is changing the, about the source, the stimulation that leads to ideas going into the pool. Um, OK, so, so here's a, there's a lot in this. And I'm, gonna, um, I'm not going to rush it, if you um, will forgive me. I'm going to try and uh, really get to the nub of what's going on here. Um, it's a classic design cycle. Um, it's kind of based on Deming, but it's not. You know, the kind of reflect, do, act kind of uh, cycle. So we're going round clockwise here, obviously. Uh, there are two important aspects to it. So this line here divides reality from the imagination. And what we have on the right-hand side is only in our head. What we have over here is what exists in actual reality, whether or not that's digital data, or a physical artifact or whatever. Um, now, going along the bottom here, we have an action. We have ac actions on the real world through some set of tools. So you think of your hand reaching out, touching a fader, 
And in order to do that, we have in, an internal working model. We have transformative knowledge about how the tools can affect the workpiece. So over here, we've, this is what we've got. And over here, this is what we want. And the trick is to move what you've got closer and closer to what you want. And we're going to call that progress. Now, you know, to take this to general psychology, that there's something else you can do. And if you can't change the world, you can do this. You can move what, what you want closer to what you've got. We call that acceptance. Um, now, as artists, and we're looking here, at, you know, this is very much about control. This is very much about taking something that we've got that's not quite right and moving it towards what we want. So in this diagram, the value here is in this progress, not in the acceptance. The acceptance does happen. Here's a typical example. You go, I'm going to write the most amazing um, kind of 90 style ambient, uh, higher intelligence agency, Pete and Hamlet kind of floaty tune and it's going to have little bleeps and stuff and you start out playing with the synthesizer and you pick up a guitar and suddenly you're playing a rock song and then you just kind of drop this dubstep thing in it and you end up with this tune it's a million miles away from what you set out to do so you were kind of seduced by the tools you you were seduced by the moment and you went with it that was constant acceptance all the way through that process is hey that's great let's go with it so the disciplined thing to do is to keep in your mind what it is you want, to stay with that and to try and work the piece toward, towards the vision that you have, which means good memory, not just a choic memory, but good auditory imagination to be able to hear that thing in your head and try and pull what you're doing towards it. So um, there are various stages um, where this information can be changed, okay? So uh, we have to listen to it. You know, everyone hears differently, and there's the room, and there's the speakers. So in this uh, apprehension, we might mishear the piece. Uh, then we're going to critically evaluate it. And the question we're asking is, this is what I've got. This is what I want. How am I going to move this over to here? How am I going to change it in such a way? Um, and to do that, I need this working model to understand how the tools I have can transform what I've got in this direction. Does that make sense to people? Okay. Classic design cycle, but I think we don't realize that how important this is in, say, music production or music uh, composition and so on. Okay, so it's a lot of this is decisions here. That some of them are artistic, some of them are engineering decisions. It doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so we've looked at intelligence, we've looked at production, and we've looked at kind of music as a as a creative process. What on earth would it mean to have intelligent music production? Okay, software. Um, can you read this okay? <laughs> I, um, the, the key here is this uh, bottom axis, right? This was a, uh, I mean, what, what are we talking about in terms of intelligence here? Are we talking about the intelligence of the audience, the intelligence of the producer, the intelligence of the tools? Or can music itself kind of intrinsically have intelligence? I mean, there are genres of music like IDM. That's intelligent dance music. Is the music intelligent? You want to ask it a question? No, it's just music, right? But we're in kind of inferring that the person that made it used intelligent processes or involved intelligence. And what worries me is that we're actually aiming a lot of IMP stuff for about here, about the zero point. We're trying to create stuff which for the, um, for the EMP producer actually takes away intelligence. It removes intelligence from the process of making the music. So how does it do that? Well, I kind of mentioned it in the um, panel discussion earlier. There are various sources from which we can create and encode intelligence. There's aggregate, where we use machine learning to work out how a whole bunch of people would do something. There's expert knowledge, where we take you know, somebody's signature process and we encode it in software, and then that just becomes a tool that people use. Um, but I think where we want to be, we want to be aiming higher. You know, we want to be aiming our software to involve uh, people who might um, consider that they were making records 
uh, maybe, and not anthems. Um, that's a bit pejorative, but you know, this is supposed to be a funny slide, so fuck it. Okay, Here, here's where uh, the problem of crutches kind of comes up. Do you remember Wally, these guys? They're always floating around on their chairs, and uh, you know, the, 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 the tension here between, you know, um, making something easy, making it convenient, and stimulating and facilitating intelligent production is, is, is a difficult problem. Um, I think there's actually an increasing gulf between software and creativity. And I hate to bring this up, but you know, we used to use logic back in the studio in Bristol in the 90s. And uh, what Apple took out of logic, you know, I don't know where that stuff went, but it all ended up on the cutting room floor now. Um, it used to be a very, very powerful tool. And I think to reach bigger markets, it got dumbed down. Um, and in, in general, I think, you know, this is kind of a feature of a lot of software. Um, and, and this comes about through good intentions. This isn't people saying, you know what this software would really benefit from is if we really dumbed it down. Yeah? No, they, you know, the, the, the good intentions are to make it more usable. But for a larger number of people, and so what you're losing is the, that expert engagement in people who want yeah, to delve deep. They want it to be difficult. They want it to present lots of possibilities. They want it to be able to have happy accidents with it and discover things that they don't really understand, but wow, hey, that's how that works. You know? So um, we've got to be careful of stuff that's overly prescriptive and what I call that like, Disney-fied version of creativity. I mean, there may be markets for that, but as an, a professional, as a, someone who thinks about this kind of stuff, I'm more leaning towards that. Uh, I want enabling tools that challenge me and, and, and give me uh, more possibilities, even when those possibilities are difficult. Okay. Um, we touched this, on this in the panel. In fact, this is really, really hard, if not impossible, to encode in any AI model is that the model, it's, the system itself subverts itself. Um, most of the big breakthroughs in music have been subversions of the, of, of the status quo. Somebody's come along and they've deliberately broken something, and, uh, and that's the new sound. So, you know, as you all know, the, the 303, the Roland's 303, was never intended to be uh, an acid kind of box. It was an auto accompaniment baseline for sort of Major Morgan and his Hammond organ at the, um, uh, you know, the Tenerife Cafe or whatever. Um, somebody got it, put it through a distortion pedal, and there was a fault in it. I, I forget, I think it's something in the ladder filter that the cue control and the range on the filter were just way outside the design parameters. So we could uh, use it for a completely new, and a whole genre of music spawned from that subversion of its original intention. And uh, I don't know how true the story is about Hendrix's guitar cabinet, but you know, they say, audio engineer wants to fix it, don't fix it. I like it like that. You know, I've got a new sound with that. And I can overdrive it, and so we have the whole distortion, and what comes out from that, you know, rock and punk. There, there is this, um, into computer science and kind of more esoteric maths. There's this guy, Gödel, who has this incompleteness theorem. He kind of says that if you're inside a system where you have rules in which the system can understand itself, it can never break outside of that system. You can, uh, you can have theorem, you can have things that are true which are unprovable within that system. Yeah. And I think this gets right to the nub of creativity. Uh, is this quest to subvert and constantly break out of the system. If you're into hacking, this is getting out of a cheroot jail. You, you know you're on a virtual machine, but you want to get out of it. Yeah? You want to get higher. You want to get into a different uh, realm. Hard to explain. Okay. Software as liberation. So, you know, this process of breaking outside the constraints of the system is, in a sense, uh, Liberation, a lot of people say they play music, they feel liberated by it, they feel good. Yeah, playing music makes you feel good, right? And often listening to music kind of sets some sense of freedom off there. Um, so what I teach um, at SAE uh, and, and other places where I get the opportunity is always principles, not products. 
Um, if it's possible to teach someone a bunch of principles about how a compressor operates and how you know you have this standard operating level and you know this is where you set your threshold, rather than saying oh yeah use the waves um, you know uh, thingy. I mean maybe that would be good advice, but I'd rather you know teach the principles. So um, you know give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, and now he's got to buy a fishing rod. He's got to get a fishing license. I mean, it's just like one thing after another, right? So there's always an overhead. There's a penalty that comes with taking this approach. Um, and like I say to some of my students, I'm not here to make your life easy. If I was here to make your life easy, I'd give you the waves bundle and send you off to make music in your garage. I'm here to make your life difficult by challenging you with um, hard sums and uh, difficult processes to think about. You know, this is about discipline and mental, mental uh, rigor uh, and so on. So um, it's great that we can lower the barrier for entry, but you know, maybe our software that's intelligent should have safety nets, you know, removable stabilizers on the back and stuff. But at the end of the day, we must not place constraints on being able to pick that system apart and delve down into deeper layers. Um, never put restrictions on understanding, on tinkering. I don't like that word so much, sort of, but you know, it's become a bit more part of hacker culture now. Is it, uh, the right to tinker. Wow, I mean, never thought I'd hear those words put together um, growing up in the era that I grew up, where ev life was taking things apart and putting them back together again to figure out how they went. And we're moving into a very dark era now, I think, especially with software, with the DCMA and software patents and uh, and I'm not a fan of Apple. I make no apologies for the, or many of the corporations and the way that they lock up knowledge. You know, the way that knowledge is turned into a commodity and products are used as a way to put a barrier between a person and their creative potential. And, and ironically, they market this stuff as being enabling of creativity. I think it is, but for very small definitions of creativity. Um, so the ability to personalize stuff, the ability to, to change the very base of the system leads me to the conclusion, you know, that really the only way to go with this kind of software is in, it essentially is open source, is to be able to have the source code, is to be able to look, delve into that stuff. I've always thought that, you know, that there's a big problem here with protectionism, around ideas around intellectual property. If you're really that smart to come up with X, then you know next year you're going to come up with x squared, right? You, you don't need the world's moving too fast for protecting ideas. It's just moving too fast. You might as well put them out there and let them be free. Um, so I, I, this is very much part of my philosophy of how you allow principles and ideas to live in the world uh, and stop them potentially dying out. A lot of a lot, what I like about the AES is. Just, uh, audio engineering generally is a really good spectrum of age, uh, of people who are like, have been there and seen it and done it all, and the very young people that are just kind of getting into the technology. And I think for those of us that are a bit older, we worry about the um, replication and preservation of knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, it's something that's potentially a danger in uh, some of the, the way that we're approaching making tools. Okay, so um, <clears throat> here, here's a place that I think that this comes off the rails, and I alluded to it earlier with this bubbling. Um, a very limited idea of search and, and matching. And it comes from this idea that you know people are very bad at knowing what they want. It's true. I mean, you have to work at it, right? And at expressing what they want. So therefore, it's better to guide them. It's better to tell them what they want. And the main method of doing this is to observe their behavior and classify them and say, you are, you are this kind of thing. You are that. Therefore, I can predict kind of what, you know, what they want to do. Um, so even for things like, um, yeah, I just say it's, a, it's a limited idea of, um, of, of search and guidance. Um, I don't think artists search for ideas in this way. Um, artists look for metaphors. Think of the lyrics in most songs. They're not about what they're actually about, right? Um, 
we're looking for distortions, ambiguities. I mean, imagine putting as a constraint deliberately ambiguities into your search. You want things that can have multiple meanings. It's the very antithesis of what many uh, AIs uh, are trying to do. Uh, uh, transformative knowledge uh, is sort of uh, grapes are to wine as apples are to cider, and I'm looking for the thing which is the function. I'm looking for the, the, the function that transforms you know, between these things. So I'm not searching for, for objects, I'm searching for their, their methods or meta methods around them. Um, yeah, a progression search, you know, A, B, C, D, well, yeah, obviously E, but like given a whole bunch of uh, examples of stuff, what would come next? Uh, relational, oppositional knowledge, oh, this is an interesting one. Uh, sometimes you just know what you don't want. It's like, what do you want for dinner, Johnny? Uh, I don't want peas. Okay, um, how about carrots? No, I don't want them either. Why? Well, because you suggested them. Right? I mean, it's a defiant oppositional uh, thinking is again an attempt to break out of a system. So often, you know what you don't want, but that, that's valuable knowledge, right? It's not just like the exclusion, it's, it's something useful that could be part of a complex intelligent search engine. Okay. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> um. <laughs> right. You know, so when something's suggesting things to you all the time, it does get a bit tedious. Um, I actually quite like Clippy. I was really sad when Clippy went. Um, okay, there's some difficult concepts in here. Um, in, in bubbling. Um, Let's just deal with these top ones first. Uh, you know, sort of search is meaningless without, without sorting, without filtering. Think about actually how Google became a, a great, you know, the big company. Was uh, the page rank. That's uh, how we page it. It was about, not about the, the finding, but about like, how you present your data. How do you filter it? Um, and one of the things I think that's a big area in signal processing and music and creative endeavors in general is how to visualize very complex data in a meaningful way. Uh, I think yeah, data visualization, data representations is a huge, huge research topic. There's wonderful things that we can do to kind of show in, has anyone uh, seen that uh, synthesis environment, the music, AL, uh, music, where you're kind of, uh, GL, sorry, GL, so you're in an open GL environment and all, everything's controller data and you're just flying through this three-dimensional world and your plugins are kind of objects that you put. Huh? It's a YouTube video of it. It's amazing. I think that's a real breakthrough in sort of breaking out of the timeline paradigm of like, you know, two dimensions and a now pointer and objects and clips that kind of come along like a piano roll. Just seeing it from a different dimensional perspective. Um, but avoiding these presumptions about how things should be. Yeah. Okay. Um, Avoiding software that makes that that, I, that gives you an identity. Right. Who who watches Mr. Robot? Mr. Robot. Okay. Who thinks it's about hacking? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not necessarily about hacking, right? It's uh, about the schizophrenic condition uh, that we find ourselves in in society, um, and then particularly around identity. And something which can, software that constrains you and makes you behave in a particular way and relies on your, your identity it, it is faulted in a certain way. Have you ever heard of Gurdjieff and Ospensky as philosophers? Very esoteric, not talked about much in the West really because what they're talking about is the fact that we are not unified individuals. The self is not this integrated, singular thing that we think it is. That we're made up of many competing personalities and voices, which from moment to moment are integrated at the core of the mind to create what is, seems to be I, me. Yeah. And during the creative process, we devolve, we give voice to these different aspects of personality. 
in such a way that they're able to express themselves. Otherwise, they're, the rest of the time, they're frustrated. They're kind of kept under wraps in order for the superego to maintain a consistent and acceptable front of the, you know, a certain persona. But in the creative process, these voices, they, they get their voice, they come through. Software which wants to identify you and place you into a box and keep you there is working against the creative process, I think, all of the time. Um, so how would we create software which enables a synthesis of different personalities and different ideas that would come out during the compositional process? So I think I'm kind of getting to the end here. There's just a couple of slides left. Um, here's something we don't talk about much, which is mood. Uh, Heidegger, you know, oh, God bless him. Um, uh, other than being a Nazi, had some good ideas, right? And he was a great philosopher. And we don't visit these concepts very much. We don't talk much about uh, the big three. Talos, mood, and care. He uses the German uh, sort, sorge, sorge, um, to say the thing that, that occupies you in your life, that, that everything else really is driving towards the thing that you're trying to express about how you feel about it and what you're working towards in life. And in order, what we do is we visit this through many different moods. And during these moods, we see things differently. No? Um, mood does not feature in almost any analysis of, uh, of intelligence in the human condition. So I think it's really, really important to music. I've worked on compositional projects and I've gone back to them weeks or months later, and, and it's, see, it's like alien. It's like, I don't know who wrote this. Where does this come from? Yeah. How do I get myself back into that frame? Many of the things that uh, Fran Frances uh, our presenter earlier, Francesca, was doing the um, generative compositions, I mean, AI compositions. Um, was touching on the need for these higher level structures that could represent the feelings of music. And in order to preserve the state of a project, I think it would be really good if we could kind of tag things with, with the moods that we're in and somehow enable us to get back into a lot of the problem, especially for coders as well as composers, is when you walk away from a piece and you come back to it, it takes you a long time to get back into that zone and to find that, that, that groove and that mood again. So I think that um, it's like Heideggerian search, if you like, something that can enable you to um, get into a project on a, on a level of a mood would be quite important. OK, so that's, that kind of wraps it up. Uh, quite, there's tons of questions we could have, I guess. I really think the pub is the right place for this. Uh, I've kind of you know, sketched out a few. Um, how do we write creative software that serves humanity? makes better art? Um, how can we build reusable, portable, modular AI machine learning objects that can be put together uh, in an open source kind of way uh, into interesting tools uh, without imposing grand visions of how uh, that software should be? Um, not black boxes or opaque monoliths. Uh, programs that can understand and feel tension and contradiction, competing needs, Multiple simultaneous truths. Uh, I'm done. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Should I just take a couple of questions and, and, we'll, and we'll hit the pub? So, uh, first of all, it's uh, kind of surprising to see a um, sound engineer or uh, someone who works in the field, actually, and uh, uh, kind of um, accepts uh, open source software. This is very good. Um, <laughs> then I, I would like to ask, uh, in the end um, music uh, that you are going to create, how much your knowledge in a specific tool um, or how deep um, the depth you know this tool actually affects the value of what you in 
in the end produce uh, or make? For example, would it be uh, more, um, would it give it much more value if I would uh, create my own, uh, have my own uh, processor design and uh, make my own operating system and all this kind of stuff in that? Yeah. Or uh, is it, uh, for example, if I could uh, take, um, well, pirate uh, all the kind of plugins and uh, put them in logic and create the same thing, exact yeah. thing? Yeah. Um, does the mic pick up the question, or do you want me to repeat it? Um, my question is how much the depth of uh, the knowledge of the tool yeah. actually affects uh, the, the value, value. The, yeah. the, the value of it. Um, for my, my response would be another question, which is like, for whom? Uh, yeah. I mean, is that the value for the, the, the listener, the casual, the incidental listener, or for a published audience, or to you as the artist? Okay, if you uh, ever listened uh, to such a song, yeah. uh, would you care about that? I mean, um, specifically, uh, as a listener, yeah. uh, would you give more value to something that was creative? Uh, in yes, a I, I, think, I think I would. I'm, I, I mean, as I get older, um, my musical tastes have changed, but not just the musical tastes on the surface, but more as maturing as a person. I used to listen to music only for its sounds, like in a kind of reduced listening mode. Um, I like craft work because um, it had this clean, amazing machine-like synthesis sound, and I loved it. It just intrigued me, and, and, and all I wanted was more of that as, as a product to satisfy my need for electronic music. I find now when I think about Craftwork. I'm interested in how did like Florian and the, 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 how did those guys get together? What what was it like to be in Kling Klang Studios in in that day? How much did they really build their own synthesizers and where did they get the designs and ideas from? How did they feel about how they influenced the whole generation of music? It becomes a personal relationship, and I care about the backstory. I care about the human element to it. That doesn't amplify or lessen in any way the music, qua music, as a signal. Doesn't change it in any way at all. Um, but it changes the experience for me uh, and, and the value I attach to that music. Does that make any sense? Yes, uh, this actually, uh, uh, thank you for the answer. So uh, if we, well, uh, from my, the, the end result uh, from all this, if you found an AI, the perfect AI yeah. that would create yeah. the same th system, it wouldn't be generally, um, well, it wouldn't have this, the same value. Do you know what? The first time you did it, it would. Okay, do you know what? This is an amazing piece of music. It's made by the first AI ever that made an amazing piece of music. And I would be really curious about the people whose work had led to it and what inspired them, and again, the human backstory the thing. But the next one, nah, bollocks to it. It's just an, it's made by another eye. So you'd reach some point at which that had an immense value, but kind of, it, it's a dead end, you know? Everything that comes after it is just, it's another tune by that AI. Uh, because I know it doesn't have a deep experience of the world and, and so on. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, do, do you think uh, it's completely impossible for an AI to, at some point, have a consciousness and to actually exist as a... No. You know? No, I, I'm not sure that it... That, that, that would be very foolish to rule out. I mean, I think you're kind of trapped into some kind of... Um, uh, St. Anselm's kind of argument, existential argument about God and whatever. I mean you can't categorically say that could never happen. And um, I kind of think it could. Um, I don't know what that would be like in terms of what that would mean to humanity and not potentially like my relationship with something uh, artificially constructed that was conscious. I think it's very anthropocentric, very uh, parochial and, and conceited to think that we're the only things that could have intelligence, right? So given that there's other things in the universe that could have conscious intelligence, why would they not be made out of silicon or something like that? I think it's a perfectly plausible idea. But what I would say as a human being is that that lies in some other sphere of interest to me 
than music made by my fellow humans? That answers the question. Yeah, it does kind of, because, um, because the, the AI could also be like, you can imagine, and like a history, like what you said about craft work, and yeah. essentially, you can imagine yourself looking back into the, let's say you were living now in uh, year 3000 or whatever, and we are looking yeah. back to year 2100, and we're looking, oh, there was the AI, which is name, yeah. whatever, like, um, and it started creating this and that music. So this is also creating like a backstory to, it's creating like a narrative, an artistic narrative. I can perfectly imagine a future generation that are nostalgic about, you know, the first AIs. Um, I feel nostalgic about my ZX Spectrum. So, you know, um, it has precedent, yeah. <laughs> is, this, is this even on? Okay. Oh, it's recording. Okay, perfect. Um, so I have a comment and then a question. Um, you mentioned earlier AI or um, higher intelligence, and then you kind of glanced mm. past it. Mm. Um, but I guess there's a thought experiment that that made me think of. There's the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, who meant who does this in a lot of talks, and he mentions like humans and chimpanzees are 99% similar DNA. Yeah. So you can imagine like a being which is only 1% different in the other direction yeah. as a thought experiment yeah. for thinking about that. So that's an interesting thing. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you uh, brought up the idea of questioning music and creativity as a product, mm. Um, mm. which I found really interesting. But um, the fact is, is like we live in this capitalist society and I have to survive and I'd rather do it by not having like a job outside of, you know, music production. Yeah. Um, so how do I set, how does a person, maybe this is a discussion for the pub, but how do you separate the creative process from like, uh, that we live in the society that we live in? And I can't help but think of your Schrodinger's guitar example yeah. as being sort of a privileged position where, uh, certain people have more opportunities for Schrodinger's guitar experiences because of their position. Yeah, I think at the heart of, I'm not quite sure exactly what the question is, but I suspect at the heart of it is a kind of a dichotomy that may be a false dichotomy to do with earning a living as a creative person and the necessity of engaging in um, the, uh, the situation in which we find ourselves, put it that way. Um, I can, I, I can answer it just by giving you some thoughts from, from the top of my own head that I sometimes talk about with my students, is on the one hand, there is this sense in which if you could do what you love for a job, wouldn't that be amazing? So you could wake up and do what you were going to do anyway that day, and you just happen to make money from it. And many people have that approach to being a creative professional. And it works for them, and they never lose the magic. Um, part of my experience and other experiences that I've seen is that whatever you do becomes work. So to a certain extent, you will always compromise. And if you're unlucky, you may find that the thing that you love just becomes the thing that you do for money. And you have to find another outlet for your soul, for one of a, a better word. Um, so beware of that. Um, I think it's important to have a professional attitude and to be able to, you know, to serve, you know, to be in the sausage factory and to make things uh, and know that they're bringing pleasure to other people and that they're, you know, making the world go round. There's nothing kind of uh, highfalutin or um, this, there's nothing you know, bad about that. Um, but I think there's a false dichotomy in, in, in there a lot of the time, which is, um, and it's around the, the concept that Eric Fromm brings up a lot to do with anime and alienation, in which we sell ourselves for money, and that process feels shameful, it feels dirty, and it, and it damages the, what we think of as creative as being somehow divine and, and, and super important in our life. So, um, you know, it's starting to sound like a bit like a life coaching uh, <laughs> response. I don't think I've got a good answer to that. Um, capitalism ain't gonna disappear anytime soon. Um, 
But I think art is a project which is bigger than capitalism. It was there long before this whole way of, uh, of approaching the world turned up. It was there when communism was there. It will be there when the next thing's there. It, the, the, the project of human transcendence is much, much bigger than the little political milieus that we find ourselves in. There'll be a day when people will laugh at capitalism or look in the history books again. Do you hear that people used to just go to work and you know, they run around obsessed by money? No. Well, look at Star Trek. Did you ever see anyone exchanging money in Star Trek? It's just like in future utopias, there's no money. But we have a real problem kind of breaking out of that and even imagining a world in which that's not the case. There will be a world like that, I have no doubt about it. But in that world, there will still be art and creativity, and people will find other problems with it and other, way, you know, uh, other values in it. So um, I'll just say that the, the artistic project is bigger than, than that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for listening. Let's get some beers.